Hi everyone, welcome to Berkey's Book Time. Um, Archibald's here. Archie! Archibald! Archie! He's very wet because we've just been out for a walk in the rain. It started raining while we were out. Where has this rain come from? Um, anyway, I'd like to say thank you to you all because you all sent me some lovely, lovely work this week. Some photographs, some of your writing. It's been so amazing catching up with you all and seeing what you've all been doing. But it's meant that I didn't have time to upload the next part of chapter seven. But I'm going to do that now for you. I'd like to say hi to Quinn and Marshall. Hi, boys. These boys are still loving Berkey's book time and they're really enjoying it. I'm really thinking about the characters as well, which I love boys, so keep that up. I think Quinn has even been doing a little bit of story writing of his own. So that's amazing, Quinn, keep that up. I'd love to read that when we get back to school. Okay, if you remember in the first part of chapter seven, Lily was asking questions about what provision her father had made for the mechanicals. So let's find out what's going to happen next. Here we go. Mr. Sunder shuffled through the few short pages, his lips moving as he read the words. Finally, he turned them over as if he expected to find something on their blank side. I'm afraid not, sir, miss. Beneath his spectacles, his eyes darted nervously to Madame. It would seem there are no clauses relating to mechanimals in this uh, document. Professor Silverfish leaned forward in his chair. Do you not think that odd, sir? Not in my experience, Mr. Sunder replied. Well, said Professor Silverfish, I do. I do too, Lily said. Papa loved his mechanicals as much as he loved me and Mama. They're practically a part of our family, Mrs. Rust especially. After Mama, she was the one who took care of me. I would have expected him to at least have thought about her. When death is preying on their mind, people do not always behave as they did in life, Miss Hartman, the lawyer said. Lily's heart kicked in her chest. Then you do think my papa is dead? Uh, not at all, Mr. Sunder gulped. I'm merely hypothesising. I mean, until he's found or until he is pronounced, uh, <clears throat> that's to say... He shuffled his papers in his hands nervously. Anyway, Miss Hartman, if you knew anything about legal matters... And being un enfant, Madame cut in, we wouldn't expect you to. Yes, <clears throat> quite, Mr. Sunder continued. Then you'd know mechanicals don't have the same rights as we humans. He looked to Madame once more for help. Uh, for example, mechanicals are not allowed to own things or be in charge of a steam vehicle or an airship or indeed a child. Things a responsible adult might undertake are forbidden to them on the grounds they lack intelligence, selfhood, etc., etc., which is why your father picked me as your guardian, Madame Verdigris added. Is this true? Lily asked the professor. I'm afraid so, he said. I never considered the legal side of things. Bien, enough of this. Madame placed her hands on the headrest of Lily's chair. Let Mr. Sunder finish. He's a very busy man. Mr. Sunder. Tell Lily about the other matter we discussed. Yes, ma'am, but it's rather delicate. If I might speak to the adults alone first. Lily gave a pleading look to the professor. I think, he said, if it relates to Lily's rights, she should be present. We must respect... D'accord, the housekeeper cut him off. You may speak in front of the child. Mr. Sunday, I suppose the professor is right. There should be no secrets between us. She grasped Lily's shoulder and gave it a painful squeeze. As you wish. Mr. Sunder smoothed the tuft of greasy hair atop his head, playing for time. Ladies, Professor Silverfish, thanks to Professor Hartman's projects, the estate has accrued considerable debts over the years more than his patents and holdings are worth. What do you mean exactly? Professor Silverfish asked. 
I mean the money is insufficient to pay either for Lily's keep or to stay in this house. You see, Madame said to Lily, oh, it is as I feared. Professor Silverfish shook his head. I don't understand. None of this seems possible. Surely John would have sold his patents. If things were so bad, he'd have done everything in his power to make sure Lily was provided for. Perhaps he was less circumspect than you imagine, sir. Mr. Sunder took his glasses from his nose and polished them again vigorously with his handkerchief. So, what would you advise us to do? Madame asked. Mr. Sunder glanced between Lily and Madame, his gaze lingering on Madame. My advice to you, Miss Hartman, to your guardian, is to sell everything of value, mechanicals, devices, and then, possibly even the building itself. You can't, said Lily. They're Papa's things, our things. It seems we have no choice, Madame Verdigris told her grimly. Lily couldn't believe it. There was always a choice, wasn't there? Isn't that what people said? If only she could persuade them. But then she saw the professor's resigned expression and the lawyer's solemn face. She turned and caught the brief, smug smile on Madame's lips and was shocked to realise that this horrible woman was now in charge of her life. Afterwards, while Madame showed Mr Sunder to the door, Lily took Professor Silverfish aside. Oh, please don't leave me alone with her, she begged. The professor's face dropped. I'm sorry, Lily. There's nothing I can do. It's your father's decree, and for the moment, I don't think it would be wise to go against. Despite the fact, I don't feel Madame Verdigris is entirely trustworthy. Lily shook her head. She isn't. She said, she, she told me, Mrs. Rose told me things about her, how deliberately she ran down the mechanicals yesterday, and... She's gone through Papa's papers while he's been away. Really? Professor Silverfish looked shocked. Well, that doesn't sound like something she should be doing. No, Lily agreed. She took the professor's coat down from the hat stand and helped him as he wheezily struggled into it. Then she buttoned the front closed over his bulky mechanical heart. Professor Silverfish put on his top hat tapping the rim until it sat comfortably on his head. If you like, he said finally, I can arrange to have John's things stored at the Mechanist Guild. I'm sure it's something you would have wanted, to help other researchers making new machines. But only if you're happy with such a decision, Lily. I'm happy with it, Lily said. They had reached the front door and she stared at Madame's poker straight back. The woman was standing on the driveway waving to the lawyer as he put it away in his little grey steam wagon. Good. The professor ruffled Lily's hair and stepped out into the cold. I want you to do one more thing for me, Lily. I want you to keep an eye on your guardian and report back on her movements. He took a card from his pocket and placed it in Lily's hand, closing her fingers around it. The card said, with the compliments of Professor Silverfish, makers of first-class mechanicals and mechanimals, 9 Riverside Walk, Chelsea. This is my new London address. You can write or telegraph any time to tell me how you're getting on. And if there's anything else you need... He gave an embarrassed cough. <clears throat> I'm so sorry we've been out of touch for so long, Lily. I'd only recently returned to England when I heard the terrible news and I felt it was imperative to come and visit you. I'm very glad you did. She gave him one more hug. I do wish you and Papa hadn't lost contact. Well, it was understandable, really. Towards the end of his time in London, we'd, we'd had a falling out. About what? Oh, the business, mostly. And because I was sick, I missed your mother's funeral for which I don't think he ever forgave me. Professor Silverfish gave a start when he saw Madame Verdigris approaching up the steps of the porch. But now is not the time to talk about that. Next time you're in London, you must visit me and I'll tell you about it. 
He folded his arms over the ticking machine on his chest. Right, I'm afraid I have to go. There are things I need to do for my health. I do hope they find your father, Lily. If you need advice, or you have any further trouble with her, he nodded at Madame, then you must contact me right away. Thank you, I shall, and I shall keep this safe. Lily slipped the card into her pocket. See you do. The professor bent down and kissed her on the top of the head before striding away from the manor. As he passed Madame, he didn't even tip his hat. What was all that about? she asked, but Lily brushed her aside and ran to the edge of the porch. She watched her godfather get into his Rolls Royce Phantom steam wagon. Her last hope was leaving without her. When he was seated comfortably, the professor looked back and gave her a brief wave goodbye. Then he signalled to his mechanical chauffeur and they drove off down the drive, making tracks in the deepened snow. And that's it. End of chapter seven. Oh, poor Lily, she's left with Madame Verdigris and I don't think Madame Verdigris is very nice. What do you think, Archie? I don't think he really thinks anything. He's gone back to sleep, look. Archie Bold. Archie Bold. Archie. Oh, he's awake, look. Just in time to say goodbye to everybody. Oh, goodbye. Right, everyone, it's really nice to be back reading to you all, but keep sending me that work. I really love to hear from you all. I hope you're doing well, and let's hope that this sunshine comes back this weekend for us all, eh? Okay, take care, everyone. Bye.